Good afternoon, everyone. Just a few items to pass along at the top, and then we'll get right to your questions. Uh, as some of you may be aware, the Department of Defense released a statement earlier today regarding support to the Department of Homeland Security, which I'll reiterate here from the podium. At the request of the Department of Homeland Security, Secretary Austin approved a temporary Department of Defense increase of an additional 1,500 military personnel to supplement U.S. Customs and Border Protection efforts on the U.S. Southwest border. For 90 days, these 1,500 military personnel who will be sourced from the active duty component will fill critical capability gaps, such as ground-based detection and monitoring, data entry, and warehouse support until CPV can address these needs through contracted support. Military personnel will not directly participate in law enforcement activities. It's important to note that the department is also evaluating options on how we might replace these deploying forces in stride with other sources to include potentially forces from the reserve component and contracted support. And while this request is for 90 days, I would point out that DOD has supported DHS on the southwest border for 18 of the last 22 years and every year since 2006. Shifting gears, the Department of Defense through U.S. Africa Command remains committed to supporting the Department of State's efforts in Sudan. Over this past weekend, this support involved organizing and synchronizing transportation from Khartoum to Port Sudan and on to Saudi Arabia for U.S. citizens and others who wished to depart Sudan. Today, the USNS Brunswick, along with the USS Truxton and USS Polar, remain in the vicinity of Port Sudan and are able to provide support to the evacuation mission as needed. Additionally, ISR assets continue 24-7 overwatch over potential land evacuation routes. And AFRICOM's deconfliction cell continues to distribute relevant information to the Department of State, our allies and partners, and international NGOs to help enable informed decision making. Looking ahead, Secretary Austin looks very forward to welcoming Philippines President Marcos to the Pentagon tomorrow. It's important to point out that we're standing at a transformational moment in the U.S.-Philippines alliance. We've made great strides recently in advancing our bilateral defense relationship from announcing four new enhanced defense cooperation agreement sites to successfully completing the largest ever iteration of our annual bilateral exercise, Balakatan. Secretary Austin and President Marcos will discuss a wide range of security topics, including support for the Philippines' defense modernization efforts, and expanding operational cooperation in the South China Sea. Separately, the Department of Defense is joining with the U.S. Small Business Administration and our interagency partners in celebrating National Small Business Week, April 30th through May 6th. As many of you know, small businesses play an absolutely vital role in securing our nation. In fact, more than 70% of the U.S. defense industrial base is made up of manufacturing companies with 20 or fewer employees. The department released a new small business strategy in February of this year and has a range of programs to both, assi uh, both assist and encourage small companies to do business with the DOD. More information on DOD's small business initiatives can be found on the DOD website. Finally, the Department of Defense Outreach Office is proud to announce the premiere of Chopped Military Salute on the Food Network hosted by Tim Allen. The five-part tournament features 16 active duty chefs from the U.S. Navy, U.S. Air Force, U.S. Marine Corps, and U.S. Army competing with their service for a slot in the final joint service competition. Chopped Military Salute premiered Tuesday, April 25, and we would encourage everyone to tune in every Tuesday from now until May 23rd to see these talented service members in action. And with that, we'll get to your questions. We'll go to AP Lita Beldor. Thanks, Pat. Um, can you say when you expect these troops to arrive at the border, even... Um, in a range of days in the coming week or presumably by May 11th, uh, would that be accurate? Do you expect these will be active duty troops or are you going to try to have to pull some from the guard? And third, sorry, um, in the past, DOD requested that DHS provide quarterly reports updating as to when and how DHS was going to be able to take over these jobs on the border. Is DOD getting these quarterly updates? And is the department confident or concerned that DHS will or won't be able to 
meet this requirement by the end of the fiscal year. Yeah, thanks, Lita. Um, so on, on your first question, uh, right now, I think we'll see uh, you, uh, these troops arrive as early as uh, May 10th uh, and then in the coming weeks. Uh, again, these will be active duty forces, uh, although, as I mentioned at the top, uh, we continue to explore other options so that we could uh, return those active duty forces back to their home stations in stride with potentially reserve component or contracted uh, entities. Uh, again, that's work that we'll, we'll continue to do. Uh, as far as um, quarterly reports, um, I'll have to take that question for you. I can tell you that, you know, as a matter of course, we do regularly communicate with DHS. Uh, and I think, uh, again, we're, we're uh, in a situation here where uh, DHS has requested assistance uh, and the Department of Defense is assisting on this important issue. So, thank you. Is it, um, you're, I'm sorry. Is it, uh, are you saying, just for clarification, that within this 90-day period, Correct. you would like to replace, or you will look at replacing some of these active duty troops with the National Guard or Reserve, or potentially beyond that? Uh, exactly. So within that 90-day period, again, we're, we are, uh, Secretary Austin has approved the deployment of 1,500 active duty tro troops, but again, uh, we are looking and evaluating options should we be able to uh, replace those in stride. Okay. Jen, and then we'll go to Will. Thank you, General Ryder. Um, so just which tr units will these troops be coming from and will they be helping with drug enforcement because that's what the original executive order from the president said yeah so in in terms of the types of work that they'll be doing uh, as i highlighted at the top uh, these will be uh, very much focused on uh, support tasks to uh, cbp so uh, no uh, and i'll just leave it at that uh, i mean i mean what I said. Uh, in terms of the specific units, uh, these forces will come from the Army and the U.S. Marine Corps, um, but I'd refer you to the services to talk about specific units that will be tasked. And in 2018, just before the midterm elections, President Trump ordered 5,200 U.S. troops to fortify the border. At the time, Democrats and former uh, military officials and officers came out against that, saying they were being used for political reasons. How is this different? Yeah, so, you know, really my focus here is on talking about what we've been asked to do and, and what we're doing. Uh, clearly, DHS felt that there was a need uh, for the Department of Defense to assist so that they can continue to do their important work. Secretary Austin approved that request, and so that's what we're focused on. Thank you. Yes, it will. Thank you. Um, two questions on the on the border. What is the current were there prior to the fifteen hundred being deployed, and what necessitated this additional deployment? Now, is it was it the changes on May eleventh that are coming up, or is there any other reason regarding yeah, it? Yeah, that's correct. So, uh, in light of the changes on May eleventh and the uh, anticipated surge, uh, DHS did reach out and, and request this support. Uh, in terms of the number of uh, U.S. military that are there now, uh, there are tw approximately 2,500 uh, U.S. military uh, who are National Guard forces. Uh, they are focused, uh, again, on supporting CBP with detection and monitoring and aviation support. Tony? I have a couple uh, non-border questions. Uh, Ukraine, are there any PDAs or Ukraine Security Assistance Initiative contracts in the works that may be released in the next couple weeks? to help the potential spring invasion, spring uh, offensive? Uh, so, so first of all, uh, I don't have anything to announce today in regards to any upcoming um, security assistance packages, although uh, broadly speaking, we will continue to support Ukraine with security assistance uh, going forward and as we have been doing. Um, I'm not gonna get into the specifics on timing in terms of any potential counteroffensive. Uh, other than to say from the very beginning, we've been working closely with Ukrainian leaders, with our allies and partners to assess what Ukraine needs to defend their sovereignty uh, and to take back their, their sovereign territory. A different part of the world, uh, South Korea. Last week, the White House announced uh, a nuclear sub U a nuclear powered submarine would visit. Uh, just to clarify that, roughly when might that happen? And will this be an Ohio class that carries nuclear missiles or it will be one of those SSGNs that just carries Tomahawks. Yeah, so in terms of the timing, Tony, I'm not going to get ahead of uh, or, or announce any 
uh, timing of a deployment. Uh, it will be a, an Ohio class SSBN uh, model, uh, but that's about as specific as I can get. But it'll carry nuclear weapons, though. I, I'm not going to get into the specific payloads other than the, the type of submarine uh, will be an SSBN. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Okay. Yes, sir. Thank you very much, General. Um, a question from Syria. Uh, the killing of the Daesh leader on Saturday in an operation by the Turkish intelligence, this was announced by the Turkish president. Does the United States have any comment on that, confirmation, comment, or what do you know about this? Um, certainly. Uh, at this time, we can't corroborate those reports. Certainly, that would be welcome news, if true. Um, you know, broadly speaking, we do appreciate uh, what Turkey has done to uh, counter ISIS, um, but, but that's about as much as I Just have. Just a quick follow-up on that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we have um, times when the United States um, said that the Turkish military presence in the region has been hampering the fight against Daesh. So, like, looking at the overall, how would you assess your NATO allies' efforts against Daesh or tackling Daesh terrorism? Yeah, well, certainly, uh, as as you know, uh, in the in the border regions there uh, in in northern Syria, uh, Turkish forces have engaged with ISIS in the past. And again, I think anything that that the international community can do to help uh, with the enduring defeat of ISIS is very helpful. Thank you very much. We'll go back to Fadi and then we'll come to Qasim. Thank you. Thank you, General. So a question on, on Sudan. You mentioned the, the three Navy ships uh, supporting the evacuation from Port Sudan to uh, Saudi Arabia. So I was wondering if you can give more details on the type of activities they were involved uh, in throughout the, the weekend and up until now in, in this uh, su supporting role? Sure. Um, so to my knowledge, um, we had the uh, Brunswick uh, was able to assist with the evacuation of uh, approximately 300 people from Port Sudan to Jeddah, uh, where they were uh, obviously met by uh, U.S. consular affairs officials. Uh, Again, the Brunswick has returned to Port Sudan to be available uh, to transport any additional citizens uh, or others who may require transport out of Sudan. And the other two ships are just uh, in the sea in case they were uh, called upon to, uh, uh, to be involved? Correct, correct. Just to, to, provide, to provide us with options uh, should we need that capability. Thank you. Thank you. Kasim. Thank you, General. I have two questions, actually. One follow-up. So have, has there been any communications between Turkish and American militaries with respect to the killing of the ISIS leader? Um, I don't have that. I, I don't know, Kasim. I would refer you to CENCOM, or I'm sorry, to UCOM to ask them um, what, what type of communication there may have been. Okay, and then, um, second question. We have seen Russians have increased the barrage of missile strikes in Ukraine. Can you update us on the battlefield currently in Ukraine? Sure. Uh, I mean, broadly speaking, uh, we continue to see heavy fighting in Bakhmut. Uh, again, it, it's been tenuous for a while there now. Um, as you highlight, we've seen uh, Russia firing missiles uh, into uh, civilian infrastructure. Um, again, nothing new, unfortunately, for them. Um, but largely along the front lines, it continues to remain static. Thank you. Let me go to Rio and then go back here and then I'll come back to you, Jennifer. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, General. Uh, yesterday, the U.S. and the Philippines agreed to, uh, agreed to establish a framework of trilateral cooperation with Japan and Australia, respectively. So can you share a little bit more details, more, more, a little bit more specifics on the, what the Pentagon wants to do with this new trilateral format militarily moving forward? Yeah, sure. Um, well, I don't, I don't have anything specific to announce today, Rio. I would tell you that uh, the Philippines, Japan, and Australia continue to remain uh, very essential allies for us. Uh, we obviously share uh, a common focus and common values when it comes to promoting peace, stability, and security in the Indo-Pacific region. And so we're going to continue to look at ways that we can work together uh, to achieve that end. Thank you very much. Go back here, and then we'll go to Rio over here. Hi, uh, Caitlin Kenny with Defense One. Um, tomorrow is World Press Freedom Day, and it's been more than 10 years since reporter Austin Tice was captured in Syria. 
Can you provide an update on what the Pentagon's efforts are to help bring Tice home? And can you explain what may be hindering the government's effort to bring him back? Thank you. Yeah, thanks very much. Um, so first of all, I would just offer, again, our, our thoughts and prayers uh, to the Tice family. Um, while I don't have an update to provide today uh, from the Pentagon in terms of uh, efforts to, re to recover uh, or, or find Austin, I would say that we do continue to recognize the important work that journalists like Austin uh, or Evan uh, Gershkovich and many others have done and continue to do around the world uh, to report on important issues as part of a free and independent press. Thank you. Bro. Thank you, General. Uh, I have a follow-up question on the visit of Philippine President Marcos to the U.S. So yesterday, White House announced that two countries are adopting a new defense guideline. So through this new defense guideline, how can U.S. and Philippines prepare for the potential contingency in the region, including the invasion of Taiwan? Sure. Um, so we'll, we'll obviously have much more to provide tomorrow after uh, the president's visit to the Pentagon. Um, to underscore your point, uh, you've heard the White House talk about the fact that uh, the United States and the Philippines will be adopting bilateral defense guidelines. And what these will do is help to institutionalize key bilateral priorities, mechanisms, and processes that will help deepen our alliance. Uh, what we're looking to do here is uh, look at enhanced bilateral planning, information sharing, uh, accelerated defense capability development, and collaboration on emerging security technology. So again, we'll have much more to provide in the in the days ahead. Thank you, Jennifer. And then I'll go to Mike. Just a quick follow-up, General Ryder. Um, why are these active duty troops being sent to the border and not National Guard? Um, is this just an effort to message to the tens of thousands of uh, migrants on the other side of the border not to come across by using active duty troops? Um, because I seem to remember a few years back when the Trump administration wanted to send troops down there that there was concern by using active duty troops that you would affect readiness. Yeah, so really this is about uh, being responsive. Uh, DHS has asked us uh, for this support. Uh, and so uh, the ability to rapidly provide support from our active duty forces uh, is, is really the key here. Uh, again, um, we are, as I mentioned, we're evaluating options to look at potentially replacing some of those forces uh, with reserve or contracted support. And as you know, calling up reserve component forces involves some time associated with that. Uh, and so by tasking the active duty forces, we're able to meet this request uh, very urgently uh, and, and support uh, DHS. And so it won't affect readiness? Uh, it will not affect readiness. Phil. Hey there. Uh, just uh, uh, wondering if you've uh, now, if the DOD assesses that it now knows the totality of the material leaked by Airman Teixeira and whether or not you've uh, initiated or completed a damage assessment. Thank you. I'm sorry, Phil. Can you say that first part again? Yeah, whether or not the DOD now uh, knows that assesses that it knows the totality of the I material see. leaked by Airman Teixeira and whether or not you've initiated or completed a damage assessment. Thank you. Yeah, so that work is ongoing. Uh, th as you know, the secretary directed that we do a comprehensive review uh, of, of the impact uh, of that leak, uh, and so that work is ongoing, as is the criminal investigation into uh, the airmen specifically. So then to be clear, then you're not quite sure yet. It's not, it's not clear yet whether or not you know the totality of the we material. Continue to, we continue to evaluate uh, just exactly what was leaked out, uh, leaked as part of this uh, unauthorized disclosure. Thank you. Yep. Yes, sir. Go here and then over to Mike. Thank you, sir. On Ukraine, um, in January and in November, uh, General Milley stated that there are well over 100,000 Russian casualties. And then yesterday, uh, NSC's Kirby stated that there was, uh, since December, about 100,000 Russian casualties with 20,000 dead. So is it safe to assume that there are now well over 200,000 Russian casualties in Ukraine? Uh, again, I'm not going to have anything to add beyond what uh, Mr. Kirby provided yesterday, other than to say this, this conflict has been bloody from the beginning. Uh, Russia, Russia's invasion has caused the death of, uh, of thousands and thousands of people. 
Uh, and again, another reason why we would call on Russia to end this, cease, this needless and senseless uh, war uh, as quickly as possible immediately. Thank you. And l last question, go to Mike here. Um, change the subject a bit. Uh, Archbishop Timothy Broglio of the Military Archdiocese sent out a letter a couple days ago criticizing Secretary Austin's policy saying that it mandates federal funding for abortion travel and compels military commanders to authorize such undertakings. He said the policy fails to incorporate basic conscience protection and creates First Amendment pitfalls for military commanders. I was wondering if the Pentagon has any thoughts on any comment upon the Archbishop? Yeah, I, I don't. I don't have a comment to provide on the Archbishop's letter. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, everybody. Appreciate it.